Beauty is truth. Truth is beauty. Truth alone triumphs. I'm Irish, and as an Irish man, I need to tell stories. It's part of how we behave. The stories that I'd like to tell are all about patterns. Patterns of living, patterns of acting, patterns of transformation. And the first story I'd like to tell you is going to be about a camel, a lion, and a dragon. Now, who here wants to tell and hear a story about a dragon? I can't hear you. More, we want to hear stories about dragons, yes? Right, good morning. This particular story comes from Nietzsche, philosopher. And he talks about the three stages of transformation. And I'd like to use this story to tell you the difference between change and transformation. They are not the same. They are related and they are different. Nietzsche's story. It begins with a camel. You are a camel. There are many things that are put on you to carry. There's a lot of weight that is put on you to carry. Your education, your society, the rights, the wrongs. You are a camel. And at a particular stage, after many changes, you go into the desert. And when you're in the desert, a transformation takes place where the camel becomes a lion. Now, a lion is very different than a camel. A lion doesn't carry anything. A lion has its own personality. A lion is its own person. And the lion wanders around the desert and goes through many changes until it comes across a dragon. And a battle takes place between the lion and the dragon. A battle that is very vicious. Now, who wins? If the dragon wins, we become the camel again. If the lion wins, we become a child. A child that sees the world for the first time. Innocent, it learns. Three stages of transformation. Now, how excited are we? Before you go into a deeper state of learning, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about how I'm going to present. I'm going to draw as I speak. This is going to be a visual, verbal experience. Are we ready? Are we sure? Are we ready? <laughs> All right. Success. Success is not a point. Success is a path. Success is not a point. Success is a path. Success is not something that you reach. Success is something that we move towards. As we move on this path, we discover that different events take place. And as we become older and more mature, we realize that those events actually are all connected. Now, this is a very old traditional Celtic symbol. It's in actually in many cultures. 
And coming from the Irish culture, this symbol represents eternity and unity. Eternity because no matter where you start, you always come back to the same place. No matter which path you take, you will always come back to the same place. It's a journey. It's also about unity because everything is connected to everything. This is our world today, ladies and gentlemen. Now, let me tell you some stories about Irish people. So there was an Irish guy. This is the Irish guy and his wife. And it was his birthday. So, for his birthday, his wife bought him two ties for his new suit. One of them was a striped tie, and the other one was a dotted tie. So, the next day, he's going out to work, and he chose to wear the striped tie. And his wife said, I knew you didn't like the dotted one. This, ladies and gentlemen, is marriage. <laughs> Different points of view. And always remember, she is correct. Now, this, ladies and gentlemen, is actually a closed system. It's actually what is called a game without end. It is a closed system. Many things can happen within that system. Many changes can happen within that system. And yet the system doesn't change. The only thing that will change that system is something outside that actually affects the system. This here is called first order change. It's not really change. It's change within a system. This here is called second order change. And that is transformation. This is growing as a camel. This here is transforming into a lion. Another way of saying it is that you're dreaming, you're, you're, you're having a dream, you're asleep, you're dreaming. And no matter what happens in the dream, you're still within the dream. Only when we wake up does a transformation take place. So we're talking about change at this conference. I think it's an excellent word and I'd like to make a distinction between change and transformation. So, there's... There's something else that I think is quite common. I think many people know this trick. And it's this nine-dotted sequence. And in this nine-dotted sequence, you have to join all of the nine dots with four lines. You guys know this, right? Yeah? And if you know, the ans if you know it, you know the answer. It's obvious. The trick is, however, how do you join those nine dots with only four lines? Now, if you don't know it, and I have to admit, when I didn't know it at first, I couldn't solve it, because I actually made the mistake of working within the box. Working within the box is first order change. The solution to join the nine dots with only four lines means you have to start outside the box and continue to break the box to be able to join the lines. That is second order change. Second order change is transformation. Now the interesting thing about this is, oh by the way, there's a beautiful term, think outside the box. Beautiful term. Now unfortunately it's used incorrectly many times, and yet the essence of it is absolutely correct. The box is the system, the system where change is taking place. Outside of the box is a transformation. 
interesting to realize that second order change is illogical. It is illogical. What is logical is in the box. What is logical is to keep the system going as it's going. It is illogical to find something outside of that. This is creativity at the heart of design. Right. So, here's the challenge. You're in a room, and in that room is a cougar. This is a cougar. It's a very vicious animal, right? As you can see, this is a cougar. Now, next to the cougar is a cobra. It's an excellent drawing of a cobra, as you can see. Now, a cougar and a cobra are very vicious, right? Now, it gets worse because you're in a room with these two and you're in a room with a client. <laughs> All right, guys, it's, it's, it's quite bad, right? You're in a room, cougar, cobra, client. Now, you've got a gun, and you've only got two bullets in the, in the gun. Who do you shoot? Obviously, you shoot the client twice. <laughs> My apologies to any clients in the room. Something is not right. Something is not right. The system that we're working in sometimes doesn't feel right. Often I think when I hear people promote the current system, it's like listening to somebody who's falling from the 50th floor of a building and saying that the view is beautiful. Something's not right. There's a call that we have. There's, an, there's a call that we have for an adventure. And the call is saying to us that there is a new mathematics. And the new mathematics is as follows. Okay. This is one plus one equals one. This is one plus one equals Two. This is one plus one equals three. This is one plus one plus one equals one hundred and eleven. New mathematics, ladies and gentlemen. We are living in a connected world. We no longer live in a disconnected world. I don't know if we ever did, by the way. We're living in a connected world. Not only are we connected, it is actually living. And in the living connected world, we have synergy. In a multi-connected world, we have exponential growth. We've gone beyond synergy. This is very exciting, guys. This gives us an opportunity to see things in a very different way. Now, one of the interesting things that I'd like to actually define as quickly as possible is design. This is the now. That's the past. This is the future. Okay. The past exists. Because the past exists, we can analyze the past. Can we analyze the future? No. It doesn't exist. We could, we could take learnings from the past and say, well, probably this is what will happen. We can't analyze the future. Instead, we need to design the future. This, for me, is the definition of design. Designing future possibilities, designing alternatives. 
So when we talk about a conference on design that deals with change, I get excited. This is what it's about. The challenges that we have in today's world are very different than we've ever had before. We can't solve them with what we've done before. We need to, we need to design new solutions. And what begins to happen is we can look at the world, and this is the world, as you can clearly see. Here's India, here's America, and this is Ireland. When we look at the world, we can imagine that there are two forces acting on the world. There is a negative force and there's a positive force. There's a deconstructive force and there's a constructive force. There's a disunity and there's a unification. Two forces happening at the same time. Most of our media is giving us this. And yet, when we look at the world from a wider perspective, we see that this is happening just as much. Now, if you actually want a job description, your job description is contribute to that. Meaningful work is to contribute to the constructive forces that are happening on the world. This is happening without your help. Please focus here. Now, all of this is fine. We're in a new world. We've got a call for an adventure to embrace this new mathematics, to work in this new context. And it's difficult. It's difficult because what we begin to realize is that the journey is not a forward journey. It is not a backward journey. Instead, it is a journey inwards. The journey is not forwards, it is not backwards, it is a journey inwards. When I work with organizations, and I deal with transformation processes within organizations, the first thing that I help them realize is it's not about moving forward or back. It's about going inwards. This means that we need to become the change. Mr. Gandhi would say, be the change you want to see in the world. It is first and foremost an inner journey. Now, the challenge with inner journeys is as follows. Growing up in Ireland, I had a dog, which by the way, remarkably looks like a cougar. It was a dog. And we were living on a particular street. And on that street, there was lots of cars. And back in Ireland, we had cars that looked like this. And our dog used to chase these cars up and down the street, up and down the street. Until unfortunately, one day, he was hit by a car. He was okay, we took him to the vet. And the vet put one of these big things around his head. You know these things that make his bark louder? Woof. Now, after a while, he recovered. Now, what was great about this was that he was a very smart dog because he learned really quickly. He learned really quickly never to chase cars again on that street. Instead, he chased them on this street. Now, we can laugh at this, and you see the difference between change and transformation. He has changed, yet he is within the system. Change takes place within a system, changing the components of the system. In order to break free from that, he has to go through a process of transformation. Now, a process of transformation is an inner journey. If we're talking about a yatra, it's about an inner journey. And I want to give you a magic weapon. I want to give you something that helps you on this journey. 
And that's the following story. Way back in the 1970s, there was a management book that was written that is called In Search of Excellence. Mr. Tom Peters wrote this book, wonderful book. Now, you don't need to re read that book because I'm going to tell you the summary right now. Summary for me, the most important thing that I got from that book was as follows. He says, companies who were not successful did this. Companies that were not successful did that. Companies that were successful did this. What's the difference? Ready, aim, fire, as opposed to fire, ready, aim. Companies that were successful did this. 1980s, bad hair, terrible music, and Coca-Cola making the decision that they should change the flavor of their drink. They did a lot of research on this. They prepared a lot. They did study groups, and the study groups told them this is an excellent idea. And after a lot of time, in preparation, they then launched a new flavor of Coca-Cola and failed miserably. Compare that to a Japanese soft drinks company. Japanese soft drink company launches 30 different flavors into the Tokyo market for a three-month period. After three months, three of those flavors have been successful. They then develop those three flavors. Make sense? A lot of risk, controlled risk. Long feedback loops, short feedback loops. This, for most of you, will realize this is actually the design process. Another way of looking at it is what we need to do is we need to act, then we need to reflect, and then, and here's a word I'm going to add in here, we then need to consult. This is the design process. We act. That can be a sketch, that can be a prototype, that can be a model. Then we reflect on it, we put it on the wall, we test it. Short feedback loop. This is a closed system. The reason that I open into consult is that I want you to consult with your colleagues. I want you to consult with the user. I want you to move it into an open system. We act, we reflect, we consult. Ladies and gentlemen, the way that we need to move through the world is as follows. When we take a, an action, it needs to move in arcs. We act, we reflect, we consult. This is the magic weapon that helps us move forward. And as we move forward, we begin to realize that we are beginning to cross a threshold. We awaken when we see the world through relationship. We awaken when we see the world through relationship. When we see things within relationship, we see them within their context. Often, many of the assignments that I would give my designers or the students that I would work with is to define the object through its relationships. If you can define it through its relationships, you've defined the context of the object. Now, of course, the metaphor that I'm using here is that there are different frames of thinking. There are different frames in how we see the world. And it's when all of those frames come together that we have a rich relationship, we have a context. This is a threshold, this is a turning point. This is asking us for commitment. And as we move through this, 
we begin to enter a new world. And in the new world, there are new rules. And here's one of them. One of the new rules is as follows. This is a cell. Now, in biology, the scientists did a lot of work for many years, and they, they believed for many years that the most intelligent part of the cell was the nucleus. In the last number of years, they've realized they're wrong. They've realized that the most intelligent part of the cell is the skin, the membrane, the edge. Because it is the skin that is alive to the world. It is the skin that decides what's right, what's wrong, what can pass in, what can pass out. And the skin or the membrane gives the feedback into the nucleus. And the nucleus then gives the feedback out. There are new rules, ladies and gentlemen. And the new rules are following this system. And I wonder, traditional management has been top-down. Nucleus out. There was a movement that was actually bottom-up, where you don't have the management at the top, the leadership at the top. Neither of these models work. The model of organization that works is one where you have a mutual respect between the leadership and everybody else within the organization. In fact, the leadership is there to serve. So let's talk about leadership. Now, to talk about leadership, I want to tell you about an Irish guy who went into a bar. So the Irish guy goes into the bar, and behind the bar, on the counter, was three of these things. Now, as you can clearly see, these are Irish parrots. Now, Irish guy goes in and he talks to the barman, and he says to the barman, what's with the parrots? And the barman says, ah, well, they're for sale. So the Irish guy says, well, okay, well, how much is the first parrot? And the barman says, ah, the first parrot is a thousand euros. A thousand euros. So well, what does he do? And the barman says, well, he talks. Now, sure enough, he talks. Slight Irish accent. But he talks, right? And he says, okay, okay, well, what about the second parrot? And he says, ah, the second parrot is 2,000 euros. 2,000 euros. What does he do? He says, well, he talks and he dances. Little Irish dance behind the bar, very impressive. Very impressive. So he says, okay, well, what about the third parrot? Well, the third parrot is 5,000 euros. 5,000 euros. What does he do? And the barman says, well, actually, I don't know, but the other two call him boss. <laughs> now, if you're not laughing at that, we know who you are. <laughs> absolutely fantastic, guys. Absolutely fantastic. Look at this closed system. Look at this. This is the way that many organizations have worked, and indeed, unfortunately, still work. It's changing. It is changing. The individual friend of mine bought a camera from a particular brand. Just after the guarantee, it broke. He brings it back. They say, I'm sorry, sir, we can't. This is outside of the warranty and so on. And he felt this was very, very unfair. So he sent out a tweet. He said, such and such a brand has treated me like this. Shortly after that, he gets a telephone call from that brand. Uh, we've just uh, seen your tweet, sir. What seems to be the problem? He explains it to them and, say, and they say, we will get you a new camera. 
he then retweets, everything's perfect. The individual brings a global organization to its knees. There is a new form of leadership, ladies and gentlemen. New form of leadership. The individual is king. So, I want to talk to you about the three levels of leadership. The three roles of leadership. There are three roles that any of us and all of us play. The first role of leadership is the individual. The individual, wherever you are, whether you work for yourself, whether you work for an organization, whatever you're doing, there's a role that, of leadership that you play as an individual. This is your circle of influence. The second role in leadership is when you start interacting. It's your interactions with people. Now, this immediately moves into this when we're in an organization. In our, it's an, in our interactions. The challenge here as a leader is to motivate yourself, is to keep yourself directed. This is individual motivation. Here, this is all about communication. This is all about how we interact with others. And what begins to happen is that those interactions become interactions of interactions. In other words, we start dealing with larger and larger and more complex organizations. And many organizations today are at this level, which I would call institutions. Well, when I say an institution that is a governmental organization, it's also just simply a business. What's happening is the individual becomes interacting towards institutions which then come back to serve the individual. Three levels of leadership. When I work with organizations, this is what I do. I work with them on their levels of leadership. How the individual needs to be motivated, how the interactions need to be based on communication methodologies, and how these individuals need to be serving the one. New roles. Just like there's new roles, there's new tasks. It's a beautiful story. Beautiful story of an architect in America that was asked to design a university campus. So she did a fantastic job. What she did was she designed three large buildings on the university campus. This is the overview. And everybody was very pleased. And then they were very surprised. Because when she finished the buildings, she didn't put down any paths. Instead, she planted grass. And then, after one semester, paths began to be formed. And paths began to be formed in locations that she was surprised about. After that semester, she then paved the paths, keeping them true to their original shape and location. None of the paths were straight. We do not walk in straight lines. A beautiful example of how we need to operate. Indeed, yesterday it was actually referred to of where we need to be a designer and a facilitator. Facilitation here leaves the system open. Open for collaboration, open for input, open for ideas. This brings me on to the three levels of design. Three levels of design are as follows. The first level of design is in 
components. You design a thing, a component. The second level of design is when you connect those components. And the third level of design is then when you consider the context of those components. Components are connected, the connections are in context, and the context goes back to serve the components. This here is when Philips Design in Holland designs a thermometer to measure the temperature. It's a component. Then what they do is they connect the thermometer to a computer to a beeper on the nurse's outfit. When the temperature goes up, the nurse comes back and deals with the patient. The component is connected. Then what Philips does is they actually take the whole concept of a hospital and start redesigning the context of a hospital. Apple comes along and they produce a iPod. Excellent form and function, it's a component. They then connect it to the world, how? iTunes. Then what they do is they take the whole concept of personal music, redefine it, and now I have an iPhone. Interesting. Let's move on. Use capacities in a common task that reduces ego and create products and services for a becoming existence. I'm sorry, what? This is the Buddhist definition of work. The Buddhist definition of work says, number one, we have to use our capacities and develop our capacities. It's the first thing we do at work. The second thing that we do at work is we engage in a common task that reduces the ego. Oh my God, such a beautiful job description. Come and work with us so you can reduce your ego. Use your capacities in a common task that reduces your ego. Only when we work with others, we realize, of course, that we need them. It's not all about me. The third thing is to create products and services for a becoming existence. What is a becoming existence? Well, I can tell you. When you see it, you know it. A becoming existence. That's your job description. That's the purpose of change becoming transformation. Now, I just want to give you another beautiful insight from science. Beautiful insight from science that says, if you have carbon and you have hydrogen and you have oxygen and you put these together within the right context, Something is formed. Any ideas? Telephone? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Creates sugar. Sugar is the sweet spot that is created from carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, is there sugar in carbon? No. Is it in hydrogen? No, and it's not in oxygen. It comes together from the combination of these. Absolutely beautiful. Oh, by the way, you, no matter how sweet you are, you're not the sugar. You're the oxygen, metaphorically. Okay. As we approach the end of the role, what we begin to see in this process of transformation is that we are moving from ego systems to eco systems. This is 
the dragon. Fighting the dragon is actually fighting our ego. Overcoming the dragon is to move from an ego system into an ecosystem. And we get a reward. The reward that we get is that me becomes we. This is the sacred marriage. This is the benefit. This is the reward. Me becomes we. Now, as I re-roll, you can consider how you can take this information and use it as a transformational process. A transformational process where you realize that the me becomes a we. And when that takes place, a sweet spot is formed. A sweet spot that is formed that we can carry forward within our context of a component being connected within a context, again, creates a sweet spot. Something emerges. We begin to design for emergence. The design of emergence happens when we allow space for it to enter. It's a beautiful example about how we can do that. We're transforming now from beating the dragon to become the child again. And we begin to look at things differently. We begin to see that the role that we play is one where the me becomes the we. And the we considers the me. This is this process, this is ongoing yin and yang that continues throughout what we're doing. New roles, new tasks, new rules. So as we come back and we cross back over, and we start considering, well, what is the relationship of what we're doing? We can ask ourselves, how do we engage in a passionate relationship to the world? How could our work form a relationship that is mature? How do we define our work through relationship? What begins to happen is we realize that the actions and reflections that we take, that's very much about me. When we consult with others, it's about the we. That's opened the system. We've opened the system again. Act, reflect, consult. We move from a closed system into an open system. We realize that this journey inwards is a journey to fight the dragon. A dragon that is the ego. When we overcome that dragon, we become a child. And the child reminds us of the work that we need to do in the world. If the world is being torn apart, torn apart because of the destructive forces that are taking place, it is our job to reconstruct and make those pieces work in a new way. That, by the way, is another definition of design. The new mathematics tells us. The new mathematics tells us that we can work with components we can work with connections, and we definitely need to work within a context. That context gives us the exponential growth, moving from an ecosystem into an ecosystem. Transformation takes place at the second order, outside of the system. The system is going to change within until you change the system itself, it is a game without end. The second order change is transformation. Where we are now 
is where we started from. Success is not a point, it is a path. That path has many different points. Those points could represent very quickly an elixir of how we can see a pattern in the world, a pattern of the individual, a pattern that includes the interactions, second role that we play as a leader. And then the third role that we play as a leader is where those interactions become institutions. Three roles as a leader, from the individual to our interactions to the institutions, all held within is where we work on components. Where those components are connected. And those connections are within a context. A circle of leadership followed by a circle of innovation. And as an individual, you usually work on a component. As interactions in groups of people, you usually work in connections. And as institutions, you usually work on the context. How do we work? We act. From our action, we then get a reflection. That reflection, then we open up and consult. We take an arc. So too, as an, in, as an interaction, we act, we reflect, we consult. As an institution, working on a context, we act, we reflect, and we consult with the individual. The institution serves the individual. And I can guarantee that when we do this, when we have worked within this pattern of transformation, something sweet begins to emerge. And I believe that that sweetness is what you could call a becoming existence. I'm going to take some time for questions now and finish on a story. Thank you.